I have invited my friend, Pastor uh, Tony Williams, to come back and rejoin us. Some of you may recall he was with us a few months ago and uh, shared a powerful message of flowing out of his life. And as you guys know, I've been talking about hope. Uh, but Pastor Tony, I am so aware uh, amidst the grief uh, and the challenges that people are experiencing in all kinds of ways. That folk, even though they've heard these messages, they, they've been believing God, they're trusting God, but there are a lot of folk watching me right now, they are just feeling worn out, spiritually worn out in terms of their faith. They say, I'm trusting God, I'm believing God, but, but my situation is just growing worse. I wanted you to come back because if anybody understands that scenario, it's you. And uh, you shared a little bit about uh, your struggles um, in your message. I want to just kind of go a little deeper with that today to help people kind of connect with where you were, but also where you are now. So here's the first question. And listen, guys, we're going to do some back and forth in terms of some questions and answers. And then afterwards, Pastor Tony is going to close our year with a very, very special uh, message. So let's start. So here's the first question. You know, four years ago, you went in for what was supposed to be a simple surgery. And that simple surgery turned into four years of trauma and tragedy, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Talk a little bit about that experience. Kind of take the people who are listening, bring them inside that experience so that they can get a sense of, of, uh, of the struggles that you kind of walked through. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here with you yes. and with you, the family of NBCC. Uh, it's just a joy to return and to be able to share with you. Uh, this dilemma started uh, four years ago, December 17th. And uh, I went in to the hospital for just a simple surgery. I was supposed to be out in two days. My family was there with me. Mm. And uh, during the surgery, my uh, esophagus was punctured and my vega nerve was damaged. And uh, that caused me to be put into a coma, mm. an induced coma, uh, for a day and a night. I woke up the next day with tubes in my neck, tubes in my nose, uh, tubes going down my throat. And uh, I just, I didn't really know what happened. Uh, my family was there. My daughters and family were just very concerned. Uh, and this began uh, several weeks in the hospital uh, recovering, not able to eat, uh, not really knowing where I was. Uh, several more surgeries took place and procedures took place. And over the four years, there were over 30, uh, well, 30 procedures and surgeries that I had to deal with. And uh, this was a big trauma to me. I thought I was coming home and back to normal life. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I remember one of those times you went in for a procedure where uh, they were talking about putting a feeding tube in, yeah. which was pretty traumatic at that time. Uh, and again, they told you it was going to be a fairly simple uh, procedure. Talk about a little bit what happened. Well, that was in that day. Uh, my daughter was waiting for me. I'd go home that evening. Uh, but when she came, told me, Dad, we can go home, put on your clothes. I sat up on the gurney and almost fell over. They rushed me into an emergency surgery hmm. and found out they had punctured my colon and uh, all of that goes into your colon was into my body and I had to have a life-saving surgery that night and back in the hospital again. Hmm. And once again, this was like maybe the third or fourth time uh, that we almost lost you. And uh, it's... Uh, each time the doctors were shocked, really, uh, that he had survived. And so here you, or here you were, um, a healthy uh, person who was actively engaged in preaching and pastoring. Uh, and all of a sudden, you are uh, in the hospital, going through procedure after procedure. Uh, and now, uh, with this last procedure, they're putting you on a feeding tube. Uh, and essentially said that you're gonna, you would have to be on a feeding tube for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how, what kind of state of mind that, that left you in. Well, that was traumatic because I tell you, uh, first I was, feed, I was being fed intravenously through my veins. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went on for a year. 
And uh, my arm went through all kinds of changes of that. A um, lot of sleepless nights, a lot of crying, a lot of uh, stomach problems, issues, pain, uh, traumatization, all of these things. Um, and so it was uh, just a very difficult, difficult time. There were times where I felt and asked the Lord, just take me home. I, I, I'm fine with that. Anything but this. And then with the feeding tube and the hopelessness of it not going to change, it's going to be this way for the rest of my life, that was traumatic on me. And here I was pastoring 34 years into pastoring the church that I had founded, mm. and now I am forced to retire mm. because of health concerns, and uh, that was traumatic as well. So I had a lot of things. I was going through emotional problems in my mind physical bots, problems in my body, and all kinds of trauma that uh, just really overwhelmed me. And as a matter of fact, I'm still on the feeding tube today, but I'm learning to adjust. Thank God for the prayers of the saints, for the prayers of this church, mm. and for many others that encouraged me along the way. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. So depression and despair, you knew that firsthand. Is that right? It's yes. fair to say? Yes. My goodness. Now, during this period of time, you've also experienced quite a bit of loss in a variety of different ways. You want to talk to us a little bit about, about some of the losses that you've... Well, from. as I said, I lost uh, my career as pastoring because of illness uh, and that. Um, I lost a lot of self-esteem and uh, how I felt about myself and the brightness of my future. Hopelessness really gripped my life mm. and gripped my heart. What, what was the use? What, what, what was the issue of going on? Uh, but I continued to move forward uh, and uh, deal with those losses, the loss of career, the loss of hope, the loss of, of some functions uh, that I was able to do prior to that, being bound to the bed, sometimes weeks at a time, mm. days at a time, on my knees at night, uh, gagging uh, because of the stomach problems and the problems with my digestive system. And so I, I just felt I lost a lot of time, hope, and I felt at that time I'd lost my future. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. At that time, you felt you lost your future. And yet, guys, yet, we're sitting here talking, and uh, just in the last, I don't know what, six months, God has started to radically turn things around after four years of what you've described. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the ways that God has started to turn things around. Well, for the first two and a half years, I was unable to eat anything. Hmm. Then I could do liquids like a smoothie or something like that for the next uh, maybe year. And then just recently in the past months, I've been able to digest solid food. And that's been a great deal. I, I had to learn to chew all over again, learn to swallow all over again, and to deal with all of those things. So uh, as you know, every commercial on television, everything you look around, uh, food. And uh, as a matter of fact, my daughter and husband who lives with me, they're caterers. And so they cook fantastic <laughs> meals every week for everyone else, but I wasn't able to touch it. So I'd have to go to my room, close the door and hope the smell didn't creep through the door. Uh, but uh, we still made it. And now I'm able to taste food. I'm able to eat and uh, just a little bit, small bits at a time. But it's a turnaround for me. And really, I'm excited about it, being able to eat again, not only to smell food, but to taste it as well. Wow, that's amazing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And listen, I understand not only are you eating again and then tasting again food, all kinds of food, but you're playing golf now and speaking and engaging. Just say a little bit more about how your life well, is turning that around. That was exciting. First of all and foremost, you invited me to preach. And yeah. I hadn't spoken really in four years. And uh, once I spoke for you, it opened up some other churches and engagements that I was able to fulfill. And two weeks ago, for the first time, I, I'd golfed all over the United States. Me and my best friend and another friend of mine. Uh, we golfed every year, Scottsdale and all over. And uh, I was able to go out for my first round of golf in four years. And I played 18 holes. And I didn't do too bad for not <laughs> holding the golf club for the last uh, four years. Praise God. Praise God. So just a total different 
you know, two years ago looked dark and, and um, hopeless. Uh, and now, two years now, you're sitting here sharing uh, while life isn't perfect. Right. My goodness, you've come such a long. God has proven to be faithful. So here's the last question. And really, I think it's going to set up your message as well. Um, you know, a lot of people are listening and they're, you know, at the very edge of letting go of hope. You know, how, how did you hold on? How, how, how did you, how did you, you know, how did you hold on to this sense of hope? How did you engage faith? I mean, just help people who are listening. How, what, how did you get here? Well, th th there's a verse in Romans that says hope against hope. Mm -hmm. And there were times where I would want to give up hope, but I hoped against hope. Hope is the tether that keeps us anchored to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And so even in my worst hours, the worst nights, the worst days, uh, I held on to that. As I'd said before, sometimes the only prayer that I could pray was, Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. Or the only prayer I could pray was just the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Or I just understood that even the sighs and the groans and the moans that I had, that God was able to interpret those and know exactly what was going on with me. And there were times I couldn't even focus my eyes to read the Bible, but I held on in hope against hope. Even though things looked hopeless and I wasn't getting much hope from any outside um, uh, people or doctors or hospitals or anything, uh, I held on to the hope that God had planted in my heart and that hope kept me anchored to his presence. Wow. Wow. Thank you, man. Thank you. That's that's a great segue. Uh, in just a few moments, uh, Dr. Tony is going to come back and he's going to close this this period out with a very special message that's really anchored in the context of this conversation. It's a perfect way to close out uh, this series that we've been talking about hope and reminding people that regardless of how bleak your your situations may look, don't give up on God. Don't give up on Jesus. There is hope. In just a few moments, we'll hear from Dr. Tony Williams. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me. And thank you for allowing me to share uh, my heart and uh, the things that I've gone through. Mm. Good morning, NBCC. What a delight it is to be able to spend some time with you this morning and to share with you what God has placed on my heart. Uh, thank you, Pastor Herman, and thank you, family of NBCC, uh, for allowing me to come and share again. I, I sure appreciate it. Uh, listen, uh, I want to talk to you about the great exchange, the great exchange. You know, holding on to hope at times can be a difficult thing when we are faced with the pain and the challenges of this life. And over the past four years, as you've heard, I found myself continually engaged in the battle, and yet I found strength to move forward through prayer and through the scriptures. One passage that really gave me great hope is found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. And I was encouraged by this passage in these four years that I've been going through. It reads as follows. I'm reading Isaiah 61. And verse 1, 2, and 3, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. You know, in scriptures, we see over and over again that Jesus is called our wounded healer, while others in this world, take their wounds and wound others. Jesus takes his wounds and heals us and helps us. 
The Bible says, as a matter of fact, by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed and made whole. And he provides for us amazing and powerful alternatives to the disappointments and the hurts that we contend with every day of our lives. He makes available to us a great exchange. And we'll see as we look at these verses in the opening chapter in verse 1, we see the fullness of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Do you see it there in verse 1? The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of the Lord God, that's the Father, is upon me, and that's Jesus. He goes on to speak of good news, good news to the poor. And he goes on not only to speak of good news to the poor, but also to those who have broken hearts and those who are held captive are prisoners by their circumstances, situations, or the conditions they find themselves in. He also proclaims an acceptable time to embrace this good news, and he says the day is now. That means today is the day that we can embrace this good news. And he warns us of a coming day of reckoning. We need to realize that. And then he gives to us a wonderful, wonderful promise of comfort. I'm reminded that Jesus is not only our healer, but he's our deliverer, and he also is our comforter. And he invites us to participate in verse 3 in this tremendous and this great exchange. Look, first of all, he offers consolation to those who mourn. That is comfort and care for those who are hurting and who are grieving over some loss or hurt that they're experiencing in their lives. He provides for us that consolation. He provides for us that comfort. As a matter of fact, so to speak, he wraps his arms around us and draws us to himself and comforts us in the difficult things that we face in this life from time to time. Secondly, at the great exchange, he offers to give us beauty for ashes. As a matter of fact, in Psalms 149, he declares that he will beautify us with salvation. Gee, no matter how you're looking today, he's able to make you beautiful in his eyes. And that salvation that he beautifies us in encompasses our body, our soul, and our spirit. So no matter what level you're going through, whether it's spiritual, whether it's emotional, or whether it's a physical challenge, he's able to bring beauty into our life. He offers beauty for the burnt out ashes of our sorrows, our grief, and all of the pain that we are experiencing. As a matter of fact, he enables us to rise like a phoenix, like the phoenix that rises from the ashes of hopelessness to power and beauty. Isn't that a great exchange? Beauty for ashes. And then he goes on to offer to us as well, he offers us the oil of joy for our mourning. He offers to provide us joy and gladness in exchange for our tears, our hurts, and all of our discouragement. He gives to us his joy. Now, happiness is based on happenings. But real joy is really a gift from God. This joy that I'm talking about is like the sifting sand at the bottom of the ocean. It just sifts back and forth slowly, unlike the waves that are tossed and driven on the surface of the ocean according to the climate and things that are going around us. And so that speaks of our outer circumstances that are sometimes tossed and driven by the situations and the vicissitudes of life. But the joy he gives comes and it's located deep on the inside, deep within us. It's like the shifting sand at the bottom of the ocean. No matter what's going on at the top, no matter what's going on, Outside, there is this joy deep down on the inside that simply shifts by his presence in and out of our lives. And then lastly, he offers to us clothing of the garment of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaven. He wants to clothe us. And that 
Heaviness are the heavy burdens that we carry of depression and despondency and sadness. The oppressive things that tend to weigh us down in life. We are dealing with some heavy things over these years, considering COVID and all the things that we've had to deal with. These things are heavy and weigh heavy on our lives. But what he does in return, he says, he offers to clothe us with a garment of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaviness. He wraps us in worship. He wraps us in praise and thanksgiving. And he lifts us from underneath those heavy things that have the tendency to overwhelm us and burden us down. And so what a wonderful exchange as we come to the altar of exchange. He offers to us Beauty for ashes, consolation for our mourning. He offers us joy for our sorrows. And he offers to clothe us with a garment of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaviness. And then as you go on in that verse, it says, He plants us in the depth and the riches of his divine souls, soil, and he calls us, listen, Trees of righteousness. He calls us trees of righteousness. That is fruit-bearing trees. He identifies us as the planting of the Lord that God might be glorified in us. Even in our sorrow, even in our hurt, even in our pain, even when we are feeling hopeless, God can be glorified in us as we bear fruit as trees of righteousness. It was Jesus that said in John 15 and 8, by this my Father is glorified when you bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. Listen, hopelessness precedes this fruitfulness. And then when we are hopeful, it precedes us becoming very fruitful. And in our fruitfulness, even in the midst of hopelessness, we are able to glorify God. Listen, in the Old Testament, altars were made out of uncut stones. They just found stones and they piled them up. And listen, let me give you a clue. The simplest definition of a stone is simply this. It's a hard thing. Stones are hard things. And we can come to the Lord at this altar of exchange and we can bring the hard things of our life and we can pile them up into an altar and exchange these hard things for the beautiful gifts that he offers to us. Gifts of comfort, gifts of beauty, gifts of joy, gift of praise. This is what he offers in exchange for the hard things that we are going through, the difficult things that we are experiencing, the hopelessness that sometimes grips us as we wrestle with it. And listen, during these difficult seasons, I came daily to this great altar of exchange in need of hope, and I exchanged daily my brokenness for his amazing and gracious gifts. That's how I made it through the last four years. I'd come to the altar with my grief, with my pain, with the ashes of my life, burnt out, with my mourning, with my sorrow, with my heaviness, and I'd come to that altar and recognize that he'd offered me this wonderful exchange for these wonderful gifts, these gifts of comfort, and I've been comforted by him over the years. These gifts of beauty, and he beautified my life with salvation and also with joy. And the Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And he also gives us a praise. And no matter what we're going through, we can give the Lord praise and we can say, thank you, Lord, that I'm still here. Thank you, Lord, that the best is yet to come. Thank you for this great exchange that you provided for me. And listen, this new year, maybe there's something that you need to bring to the altar of exchange. Maybe you have a mo something you've been mourning about, a hurt or a grief that you've been dealing with. He brings if you bring that to him, he'll give you comfort and consolation. If you've got ashes and you've been burnt out or something's been destroyed you feel in your life, 
You can come to that altar and he'll give you beauty in exchange for those ashes. And if you are hurting somewhere and you've been discouraged and there's been a lot of tears that have fallen from your life, you can come to him and he'll exchange it for the oil of joy. And if you have heaviness, and many of us are heavy, we've either lost loved ones or we've lost something in our own lives or we are struggling with something that's heavy and burdened and almost has us stooped over. He promises to give us a garment of praise in exchange for that. So as we close this year out, I think this is a time to bring the hard things of your life to him and allow him at this altar of exchange that you've built with the hard things that you are experiencing. And at this altar, you can exchange for the wonderful and gracious gifts that he provides for us. And so this is how I made it through the last four years, remembering that I could always come to him and he would trade me for my hurts. He would give me his glorious and wonderful gifts in response. And so I'd like to pray with you as we prepare to close here. This is just a brief, I just wanted to share briefly how I made it through. And so let's pray just for a moment. Father, I'm so grateful for this church and for the leadership of this church. And I'm grateful for the body of Christ that this church represents. And Lord, there are those who are dealing with heavy things, who are contending with weighty issues in their life. Some are struggling with pain and hurt and sorrow and discouragement. Some even with despondency and depression. Lord, I would pray that you would be the glory and the lifter of our heads like you declared. And that as we lift our heads, we can see at this altar the wonderful and gracious gifts that you provide for us in exchange for our pain and our hurts. And so I pray that as each one approaches you, Lord, you'd minister to them at the very point of their need, and you'd lift that load, and you'd bring them from underneath the heaviness, and God, you'd bless them and anoint them with the oil of joy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. God bless you, and thank you again.